Could you ever really put enough electrodes into the brain to understand these signals in a meaningful way? In your time, no. In my time, yes. Then how many electrodes would you have to stick into your brain, though? None. None? Surely you're joking. You go in from the inside. And so the possibility occurred, occurred to me actually, that it would be uh, very intriguing uh, to use the holes that are already present in the brain to get to the brain without actually having to go through the skull. Rodolfo Linas is really one of the giants uh, in the field of neuroscience. I have friends that actually are neuroscientists and uh, when they heard that I was working with Rodolfo, uh, and I couldn't believe it actually, they said, wow, you know, how, you know, how is that possible? And the, the holes that I'm talking about are the holes produced by the fact that the brain has vessels which basically bring oxygen to the brain, may be used as pathways into the brain. Essentially, we are going to make wires that are smaller than the diameter of blood cells, and we're going to thread them up through the vascular system from a catheter that's been inserted in your leg all the way up into your brain into the smallest capillaries, the smallest blood vessels there, where the electrodes can be very close to the nerve cells in your brain without requiring major surgery to open your skull up and shove the electrodes into the surface. And if he can pull that off, then that's going to open up um, a tremendous wealth of knowledge about the brain and a tremendous ability to alter our brains in various ways. And that's incredibly exciting. Rodolfo uh, Linas actually approached our group uh, to help him create uh, a technology that would allow him to uh, navigate a wire through the intricacies of the brain. Although the engineering requirements are actually quite, uh, quite dramatic. Within a week, I had already produced some preliminary wires for the neural experiments, so it moved very quickly once it started. Well, I think there was a lot of excitement because for the first time uh, there was a way to access the brain without never touching it. And the brain being such a vital organ, uh, it's quite understandable, you, you want to leave it alone. So the technology is there. Now the question would be, yes, but can you actually put and nanowires exactly at the place you want? The answer is no, you can't. But nanowires are very small. So 500, nanometer, 500 nanometers is very small. If you think of it, that's about um, you know, 100 times less uh, uh, than the thickness of your hair. How do you push the electrode to the brain? So what you do is you actually send a certain number of them. You have a bundle, and then the bundle uh, would, uh, would be the nanowires would be allowed to, to float into the uh, uh, bloodstream until they can go no further. At the moment, we can wire a rat. We can uh, leave the, uh, the electrodes in the spinal cord. We want to know, if we do so, how long do the wires continue to work properly. We're talking about uh, five years worth of very basic research that needs to be done. It's interesting because it would be almost a perfect way to implement something known as man-machine interface. If you can simulate the brain, you can simulate vision, you can simulate auditory cortex, you can stimulate movement, uh, you can stimulate um, uh, your passions, you can simulate uh, desires, you can um, basically address your brain directly. Well, I think the idea as a whole sounds very science fiction-like. That idea also being so simple it captured people's imagination. They could see and imagine uh, that such a technology indeed uh, could be realized. If you, if, you, uh, if you want to really project and say, would it be possible to uh, uh, feel that you're in a beach and uh, have the, the sensations and the, you know, even the pleasure of being in the beach without going by brain stimulation, the answer is, well, in principle. It could be done. What else can you do? Well, uh, you can, of course, uh, in principle, communicate with another person directly. Not only just your thoughts, but in principle, your feelings. So you can get very close to somebody.
you can get into their minds and vice versa. Now, the implications of that are pretty obvious. It may be a mutual situation or it may be a one direction. Somebody gets into your brain, into your mind. The National Security Agency, the NSA, visited us and these guys are, they sort of have a mystique being members of the intelligence community. You know, the people who came are very smart. They're dressed in suits that cost more than I make in a year. I think some of their interest is potentially sinister. So, pure fantasy. You can imagine a, a, a group of people doing a job, people doing a job in, uh, in the military, uh, becoming continuously aware of their existence and what they're doing. So suddenly you have not a human, but a group of people that they, they behave as a single entity. We could call this something like a wolf pack. You would have a collective consciousness, a collective understanding. You would be basically a rather strange new device. This happened before in evolution, by the way. You know, we used to be single cell organisms, and now we are groups of single cell organisms, so, you know, as animals, right? We'll be able to do things in that we can't even imagine right now in so little time that one person could do the work of 20. But at the same time, there are other concerns. If we're able to interface directly with the brain this way, what's to say that the device you're using isn't reading your mind or controlling it? So I think there's a delicate balance that has to be made between how much, the how much any device that we connect to the brain is there to help us and how much it's there to monitor or control us. We should be controlling things. Things should not be controlling us. Now, is this to be done? Should it be done? Can it be done? Well, it probably, something like that probably could be done. The upside, of course, is uh, if you can understand, if you can feel like other persons feel, uh, the possibility is that uh, you would understand better. So we, we could, in fact, become much better human beings because one thing that we lack often is the ability to become, to put oneself in other people's shoes. The, the downside is, of course, very clear. You uh, begin to lose your individuality. We will be evolving into a rather different social entity. At the moment, we negotiate. At the moment, our, our relations are mostly uh, saying what we want other people to, to hear. We think other people. And we, of course, hide many aspects of what we're thinking. That's, in fact, the basis for politics, the basis for, for negotiations of any type. It is, therefore, very important for some people not to be totally transparent. I think that's going to be a big change in the way we interact with reality. The idea of being able to wire people's brains together in this way, to give us the ability to directly beam our thoughts to one another, sounds like science fiction. It really does. But, Basically, right now, we have proof of concept of a number of these things. I mean, man-machine interface, obviously, is one of the things that is going to happen. Absolutely.